dear God, it's a night before vacation and still these people come out to spend time studying your word and I ask you please to bless everyone who's here. Please bless us especially with your presence and with your help in understanding what we read. Please help us not to make any mistakes in our understanding, but instead, please help us to learn each of us something tonight, at least one thing that will really help our walk with you and uh, help us to know you better. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> we continue with our long study of the Minor Prophets. Tonight we're beginning a new one, Zephaniah, and tonight we'll just cover chapter 1 of Zephaniah. If you could open up your Bible to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1, and I'll just begin by reading verse 1. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 1 says the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah the son of Cushi son of Gadaliah son of Amariah son of Hezekiah in the days of Josiah the son of Ammon king of Judah all right so we understand that this thing that we're reading tonight is the speech of God the word of God um, and we know that the way that we receive the word of God is sort of almost always through a human being, a human messenger who's inspired by God to write God's word, that is, a prophet. And this prophet's name is Zephaniah. It's a little bit unusual, in, if you compare to the other prophets that we've been studying, that here in, in verse 1, we, we sort of get the lineage of the prophet Zephaniah. We're told who his, his forebears were, his father and his grandfather maybe, or anyway, people in the, who preceded him in his, his, his generation. And one of the names you'll notice that's mentioned, it says that the last ancestor that's mentioned is, it's a son of Hezekiah. And the text doesn't say that this is King Hezekiah for sure. Not many people understand this to be King Hezekiah of Judah. And if you remember from your studies of kings and chronicles, King Hezekiah was one of the good kings who ruled in, in Judah in an earlier generation. If it's true that Zephaniah is descended from the line of Hezekiah then, he would be a relative of King Josiah, who's the king during his day. They'd be cousins or something like that. And that kind of makes sense in a way because you'll notice as the content of the prophecy, Zephaniah does seem to focus on the sins of the ruling class of people and not to say so much about the, the, the poor people or farmers or something like that. It's as if his perspective might be the perspective of a royal prince you know, in, in Judah. But we can never be sure about that. The Bible just tells us that one of his forebears was named Hezekiah and it's possible that that might be King Hezekiah. I don't know how much you remember your kings from, from the study of kings in the Old Testament, but King Josiah, who we're told here is the, was a king during the time that Zephaniah was a prophet, was also one of the good kings in Judah, one of the very good kings. He's famous for, at a fairly young age, turning towards God, turning towards Yahweh, investing some of the royal treasury or some of the temple treasury and restoring the temple or sort of remodeling the temple. And while they were remodeling the temple, they discovered the book of Moses, which had evidently been pretty much ignored by the people since the time of David or the, even the time of the judges. And he brought the word of God out and he read it and he was struck to the heart. He realized how disobedient his kingdom had been. And so based on his reading of, of the Torah, he directed the people in the kingdom to start tearing down the, the idols and all of that kind of stuff. And so Josiah was the last great reformer um, in, in Judah. And some people have said that, that maybe it was the prophecy of Zephaniah that could be responsible for Josiah's reforming tendencies. And there are some things in the text you may see that, that would suggest that. 
On the other hand, there are things in the text that, that might lead you to believe that the reforming started a little bit before the time that Zephaniah began to prophesy. And it really doesn't matter, I think, because in the end, you'll we'll notice that Zephaniah's prophecy looks out beyond his own day, out beyond the Babylonian exile, and, and, and I, it seems to me even out to the very end of time. You know, Zephaniah's prophecy is really looking out quite a way. So precisely when he started to prophesy in Judah is not terribly important to understanding his message. So after this first verse, which is a kind of superscription I've been talking about that tells us who the prophet was and when he lived, and in this case, who his father and grandfather were and the things we can deduce from that, then his prophecy begins. And tonight we'll just be covering uh, chapter one. And if you'll notice, verse two reads this way. Zephaniah chapter one, verse two says, <clears throat> I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. <clears throat> I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And now if I could ask you to look at the very last verse of chapter 1, the second part of verse 18 of chapter 1, says, in the fire of his jealousy all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. <coughs> Again, for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. So it's interesting and probably important for, for us to notice as, as we begin reading in chapter 1 that the first and the last verse of the prophecy contained in chapter 1 contains almost exactly the same thought, namely that everything on the face of the earth, expressly including all of the inhabitants, of the face of the earth will be swept away and what's more that an end will come and that end will come fully I forgot my slide the end will come fully and suddenly all right so if you look at the slide which I just put up a little bit late I put up a picture of the, the globe there a picture of the world and the first and last verse are saying that the, the surface of the earth, the face of the earth, will be swept clean, he says, of all of its inhabitants. And there at the end of the chapter it says that things, will, things on the face of the earth will come to a full and a sudden end. All right. And you might wonder to yourself, and people do, whether this is hyperbole, that is a figure of speech where a person sort of overstates their case, right? Um, uh, you know. my father is as tall as a 10-story building or something like that, where you exaggerate what you say, not meaning it literally, but trying to get across the point that it's very big or it's very bad or, or something like that. That would be hyperbole. And if this is a figure of speech, then he, he wouldn't really mean that the whole earth would be swept clean. That's possible. You might wonder if this is one of those prophecies like we hear sometimes in the Bible where God foretells something really terrible and then later he relents, he repents. He, in, in a sense that applies only to God, changes his mind. The people repent and, and he turns aside his, his wrath. You might wonder that. Or you might wonder if this is a prophecy that, that means literally what it says it means in both verses that the day will come when God will sweep clean the face of the earth and put a sudden end to everything. But that just hasn't happened even yet, right? Obviously it didn't happen between the time of Zephaniah and today because we're still here. But he might be seeing beyond our time to the end of time where the earth will finally be finally be swept away and put, put to a sudden end. And certainly there are many places in the Bible, including some we've studied in this class in recent years, where the Bible is aware of a final end of time where things are swept away. We read that in the beginning of Hebrews. God rolls up the, 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 the current heaven and earth like a scroll and puts it away and there's a new heaven and a new earth. When we study Revelation, we see many visions of an end time where the current heaven and earth are replaced by a new heaven and a new earth and the heavenly Jerusalem comes down and so forth. And many other places I guess in the Bible are familiar with the idea, we see here perhaps, the same idea that the prophet is actually looking all the way out to a day when the inhabitants will be swept off of, off of the earth as they say. 
And in any case, what I want you to realize for, for now, as we go on, is that chapter 1 begins and ends with the thought of the complete destruction of the inhabitants from the face of the earth, which means that everything that's spoken in between the first and the last verse of that prophecy is encapsulated, it's contained within the idea of total destruction at the end of time. All of the ideas in between that are within the, that context. That's the literary scholars call that an incluso. Everything in, in between is included within the thought that's at the beginning and the end, almost like a bookmark. The whole chapter exists between the end of the world, said first and said second at the beginning and the end of, end of the chapter. Right, and so that's rather interesting that the prophet speaking on behalf of God is aware and wants to make his readers aware that everything's going to be swept away. And yet God, through the prophet, thinks that everything he says in between the first and the last verse is worth people hearing and of benefit to them. You, you understand why that's interesting to me? I mean, you might say, well, if it's all going to be swept away anyway, who cares about anything, right? But that's not what the prophet does. The prophet begins and ends by reminding us everything will be swept away in the end. Therefore, what I'm about to say is somehow more important. Why would that, why would that be? You have to sort of ask yourself. And if you think we've sort of accidentally, you know, understood that in the wrong way, I think that the, the extent of the destruction that the prophet sees coming upon, upon the earth is actually reiterated and underscored in verse Three. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 3 says, I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rebel with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. All right. So we have the first verse and the last verse and now the third verse sounding the same theme with emphasis and, and specificity. And in verse 2, he said, everything, you know, would be swept. Everything, arguably, includes everything, including all of, all of the human beings and the animals. But in verse 3, he adds a thought which is biblically important. He says, it also includes birds and fish. If you remember how God created the universe, and, and then there was sin, and then he decided to bring a flood, and then he knew Noah, and Noah's family went on the ark, and he told Noah, bring two by two into the ark one of every animal, including birds, but not fish. There was no aquariums inside the ark. Uh, Noah didn't take fish into the ark because the whole water was, the whole world was covered by water. The fish presumably were fine. Right? The fish of the sea would have survived the flood. God was only killing humans and, and if, if by accident animals with the flood, but not fish. Here, a prophet writing in, in, in the Bible and, and going out of his way to say that, that God is going out of his way to say he's also going to include the birds and the fish in the destruction means that this is an act of uncreation more severe than the flood at the time of Noah. All right? he's, he's, he's predicting something more severe than the flood at the time of Noah. All the humans, all the animals, all the birds, all the fish will be wiped off from the face of the earth. He doesn't mention anything about plants and he doesn't mention anything about geological formations, you know, mountains and valleys, and he doesn't mention anything about the moon and the stars and the sun. But after all, the prophecy is being spoken to conscious living beings, right? Animal life, the pinnacle of which is human beings who can actually understand this prophecy and care one way or the other what he's saying and be affected by it or benefited by it. And so, the, the prophet doesn't really need to speak about these other things. The thing he's mostly getting across is that we living beings called humans, man, live in a world that God created, and there will be a time when he's going to uncreate it, at least as far as human beings and animals and fish and birds are, are concerned. All right? So we're, we're biological life, maybe the highest form, the most like God, but, but life, biological life nonetheless, it's going to be extinguished at some, at some time, all right? The last verse, the last sentence rather in verse three, which the English Standard Version translates as, um, so, sorry, not the last, not the last sentence, the sentence that says, and the rubble with the wicked, it says in ESV, it says, I will sweep away man, beast, birds, heavens, fish, 
And then it says, and the rubble with the wicked. And different translations translate that line differently. The reason why is because the Hebrew is highly uncertain. Even if we could read Hebrew, we wouldn't be sure quite what, what to make of it. What I make of it, after reading what other people have thought, is that when he says, and the rubble with the wicked, is that when mankind is wiped away from the face of the earth, automatically wickedness is wiped off from the face of the earth. Because mankind is, is the source and the repository and the only place where wickedness can come from. God created the earth good. It was all good. Sin came from Adam and Eve. It came from man and it polluted the entire world. And when God wipes off the face of the earth, the story of sin will be finished. There won't be anybody left to sin anymore because there won't be any people capable of sinning. A rock can't sin. The moon can't sin. The sun can't sin. Only human beings can sin, or arguably animals and so on. Okay. All right, so again, we have the thought here before us that we're coming up to a time, some point in the future, when the earth will be uncreated and that will remove finally and once and for all the wickedness that has come onto the earth because of mankind. And the prophet somehow considers what's said you know, within this context as being beneficial to the people who are listening to the prophecy. So what follows then is something that could only be relevant before the end of time because at the end of time there won't be any people left to listen to this anymore. So what, what the prophet is seeing now is before the end and after his own time, which we approximately know, it's the sweep of history between the, the, the time of the reign of Josiah who tried but failed to reform Judah and the end of the world which hasn't come yet. And while these things are potentially interesting to the entire world of human beings, that is not just, not just Jews, not just people in the Middle East, but all of the nations, people in Egypt and Africa and the whole world, it was created by God and, and God has always been aware that there's a world outside of the promised land. In fact, he told Abraham that all the world would be blessed by his descendants. Israel exists to save the world. So he, God cares about the world. But this prophet begins close to home. He said the whole world will be destroyed at the end, but now as he digs into the prophecy, he begins by looking at the things that are, that are closest, closest to home. In Judah, where he himself is a prophet and where the people who are listening to his prophecy live. All right? And so let me read verses 4 through 6. The prophet says to the people listening in there in Judah, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's the city where he almost certainly lives. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Okay. This Zephaniah speaks, first of all, to the people in Judah. Okay. So the things that God says, when he says he's going to stretch out his hand against the nation of Judah, he, he means that he's going to do something that adversely affects the nation of, of Judah. What God does is not going to be good news in the first instance to any of, any of these people. In, the, in Jerusalem, all of the inhabitants, he says, all of the inhabitants will be affected. So the things that he sees in his prophecy are things that when they happen, whether we're talking about God's children or enemies of God, but if they're living in Jerusalem, if they're living in Judah, the stuff that's going to happen is going to be difficult for them, it seems, based on, on the, the way he's launching this, this prophecy. And although all of the inhabitants in Jerusalem are affected, some of them are singled out for special mention and not in a good way. All right, so first among the list of those who are specialed out for special mention are priests 
in Jerusalem. And he, he's, he mentions two kinds of priests here, the idolatrous, idolatrous priests, which presumably means priests of Baal, priests that assist people in worshiping idols, the worshiping gods other than, than Yahweh, or, or perhaps worshiping Yahweh in the wrong way, which involves an idolatrous practice. But he also mentions ordinary priests, which would mean the kind of priests that are referred to by Moses, I mean the, the priests of, of Israel. Right? So it's possible for these priests also to sin, and it seems also that, that perhaps they have sinned against God, otherwise things wouldn't be in the state that, that they're in. So he's going to cut off from this place, from Jerusalem, the remnants of Baal, and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. All right. He goes on to speak of people who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of heaven. Most people have understood that to mean, first of all, he's talking about priests that worship idols and or worship improperly Yahweh. Now he's talking about people who go up on the roof of their house and worship the stars, astrologers or people who are worshiping, you know, the, uh, worshiping the stars and heaven, heavenly objects. And finally, he singles out the people who, they do bow down and swear to the true and living God, that is to the Lord, to Yahweh, but they also swear by someone named ESV translates Milcom. Okay. Milcom is, is another point here where people are not sure what's meant. Some people think it's the proper name of a false god. Possibly an alternate uh, pronunciation of Molech. Molech was the god in the Middle East where people sacrificed their babies to it in order to bring prosperity. Some people think that it's a, re a reference to the royal family in Israel, people who they bow to the Lord, but they also bow down to the Yemen king in Jerusalem. And in that sense, this might be a sort of anti-royal prophecy. In Israel, always it's been a little bit unclear from the very beginning whether Israel's really helped much by having kings, right? It wasn't God's idea for them to have a king in the first place. They demanded a king in the time of the judges. And God said, well, okay, I'll let you have one. They picked Saul. That didn't go well. God had to pick a king for them, David. That went better. But the whole history from the time of David's son all the way down to the time of the prophet Zephaniah and everything we've been studying in this class would suggest that the kings in Israel don't really do a very good job of shepherding the people and keeping them obedient to God, right? And finally, the prophet is seeing the day when the kingdom is just going to be swept away because God's going to have to let it go. It's, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And so there have always been factors in Israel that were sort of pro-royalty and those that were sort of anti-royalty. The, the priests were sort of with the royals and the prophets were sort of against them. And even to this day, there's some disagreement about how much the Bible really is in favor of there being kingdoms. Or, or not, be, be, because it's, it, royalty is, human royalty is kind of a mixed blessing. The only king that the Bible is really comfortable with is Jesus. The king that was always intended, perhaps, and people couldn't wait for it, and so God had to give them lesser kings in the meantime, which is a lot of the trouble that they've had, is because even David himself was a sinful and disobedient king a lot of the times, right? There's never really been a good king except Jesus. So it's possible here that, that what the prophet is saying to the people in Jerusalem is, yeah, you're worshiping God, but your priests are kind of doing a bad job. You have these foreign gods, and you're also bowing down to the human kings that you've got appointed over you. And we know that most of them, from the history we have in the Bible, most of them were bad. Hezekiah was pretty good. Josiah was pretty good. Most of the rest of them were pretty bad. They're leading the people into sin and not the opposite. But in any case, it kind of doesn't matter what it is you turn away from God towards. The problem is that you've turned away from God. And the prophet is saying that you know, the, the people in Jerusalem that he's singling out are people who are turning away from God and causing other people to turn away from God. They've stopped expecting anything from God or fearing anything from God. They think that God, whatever he is, he's just not going to really bother their life too much. 
And now they're going to be badly surprised by just how real God is and just how much he's going to bother them. All right, that's the prophet is sort of coming up to that. He's saying, you, you, you people think that things are going good in Jerusalem right now. The Assyrians are now gone. The Babylonians haven't come yet. You're sort of free. Everything's good. But I've got a prophecy I need to, to tell you. So I have a picture up on the PowerPoint. That's a picture of, of the downfall of Jerusalem. And in front is a picture of one of the Baals who worshipped perhaps Molech with, has a baby in his arms, probably sacrificed the baby to that guy. And the whole picture is God looks at Jerusalem and he looks at Judah. And that's his chosen people in his chosen city. And it's just completely corrupted. And the prophet is saying, Trouble is coming to you guys before the end of time. All right, so then comes verse 7. And this is an important verse, I think, and one that's intentionally vague. So the people down through the centuries will spend a lot of time talking about it, is my, my belief. So Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7 says, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. Okay, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his his guests. All right. So here, like we saw last week in Habakkuk, remember we talked about, we heard that commandment, be silent before God. Here we see it again and probably with approximately the same meaning that we discussed previously. It's interesting in verse 6, which we just finished reading, the people were criticized for not seeking the Lord and inquiring of Him. And now here in verse 7, there's an instruction that people should be silent. And there's an interesting tension there. I don't know how you think about that. I mean, I, I get the feeling that people who have earnestly sought the Lord before now and have inquired of Him in the right way before now hear this prophecy and they understand that sometimes it's time to be silent, fearfully silent before the Lord because right now what's in view is the day of the Lord and the approaching of the day of the Lord. And so the right reaction is silence and fear. And if some other person, some person who has not been developing a relationship with God up until this point, starts talking in an impious way or talking back to God or saying something, is, it's too late for them to be talking now because the punishment has already, already come, come upon them. The day of the Lord is, is near. Okay, but I'm, I'm not sure how, how you want to think about it. Anyway, here we have be silent before the Lord God in the reverential sense that we talked about before with, with Habakkuk. People are supposed to understand to be quiet and reverent. So when he says the day of the Lord is near, the next thing you have to ask yourself is what does that mean? The day of the Lord is a term which we've seen in other prophets and you see in the Bible and it doesn't have necessarily a, a fixed meaning. The day of the Lord could and, and sometimes is used to refer to the final day at the end of time when everything is wrapped up. That's one possible meaning of the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord may also just refer to a time when God acts in a decisive way in history. And you could, we could get our computer out and look at all the places in the Bible where, where, where the day of the Lord is referred to. And I think what we'd see is that there's a range of meanings that are probably assigned to the day of the Lord. At least it's always an important day when God does something. But we can't always be sure which particular event or, or action of God is, is, is in view. So here when he says, be silent before the Lord God for the day of the Lord is near, People who are quietly, reverently reading their Bible are probably supposed to wonder, hmm, 
which day of the Lord, I wonder, are, are, we, are we talking about? Does anybody have a feeling from your own reading? He's talked at the beginning and the end and also in verse 3 about the final day when everything is swept away. Is that the day of the Lord that's being talked about here? Because if that day of the Lord is very near, <clears throat> there's hardly anything else left to talk about, is there? I, I would say almost certainly yes, at least that's the way that it comes to my ear. I think when we hear Day of the Lord, we're supposed to understand that the, the Lord is sort of always acting in history. And at various times, our attention is best drawn to this or that activity of God. Always in view is the sort of end of time that he's begun and ended this, this chapter with. But there are a lot of things in between, right? Like, like we've said a few times before, not least of which is the coming of God's son Jesus to, to the world as a man, which, which is a day of the Lord or the beginning of a day of the Lord by, by one definition. So when you read this, be silent before the Lord God, people are supposed to think, in what sense should, should I be silent? For the day of the Lord is near, people are supposed to think, yeah, that's true, but which, which day of the Lord should I be looking at? And as your attention or your discussion goes between various possibilities of the day of the Lord, various possibilities of the sort of silence we're supposed to have before God, I think that your understanding of, of God and your relationship to God is enriched more than it would be if you had a very easy particular thing being said, said to you here. At least that's what the people who translate out of Hebrew say when you read the Hebrew. It seems as if the author has been intentionally vague on some of these points so that later generations would discuss it. They had ways to be clear in Hebrew if they wanted to be. But the author Zephaniah and the Holy Spirit don't always, don't always want to be clear, right? It may be a truth that has fuzzy edges, and this, this one may do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so probably it's not just the end of time that he started out by talking about when the whole planet is swept because God, it says here, has prepared a sacrifice and he's consecrated his guests. So God is getting ready to do something before the end of time. And again, people wonder what the, what's meant here. All right. Are his guests the sacrifice? Some people think so. Um, Are his guests consecrated so that they can attend the sacrifice, but the sacrifice is something else? Right. What is the sacrifice? There's sacrifices in Israel are usually done in response to the presence of sin. There's sin, so there needs to be a sacrifice. All right. So God has prepared a sacrifice. What is the sin? Well, a lot of sin is in view in this prophecy that could demand a sacrifice. What is the sacrifice? Is it the people themselves that God will actually kill some of these people and they will be the sacrifice? Is it something short of that? Something short of giving their life that God has prepared as, as a sacrifice? Remember the story of Isaac and Abraham. You know, that Abraham went to, went to sacrifice Isaac and just when he was getting ready to do it, the angel of the Lord stopped him. God will prepare a sacrifice and then the ram came out to save his son and something else was sacrificed instead. Is it the city, the promised land, the nation, which is going to go away to Babylon that's being sacrificed by God because of the sin of his people? Is it Jesus? Is Jesus the sacrifice that God has prepared to atone for the sins of the people so that they can be punished and yet survive somehow? Okay. And I'm sorry, but Bible scholars much better than me don't know the answers to these questions. People talk about this, right? And that's the way, that's the way that, that Jewish people in particular read their Bible, is they like to talk about it and argue about it. And I wonder what does this mean? And connect it to other places in the Bible. And finally, this verse 1-7, which is why I have a picture of a guy before the blue sky with a question mark, because 
you're supposed to look at you're, you're supposed to look at a verse like this and talk about it think about it okay and I think I'd be doing you a disservice if I just pretended to know exactly what's the right way to, to understand this because it's not that kind of a not that kind of a verse it's Intentionally vague Hebrew translated into a foreign language, English, which means that we can only sort of think about what it might, what it might mean. So let's be silent before the Lord in part because we don't always understand what he's doing. The day of the Lord is near. That's always true, but we don't always know precisely which day of the Lord might be upon us next or finally. Right? The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his gift. God is up to something. And it's always, whenever God is up to something, if we know our whole Bible, it's for our benefit. It's always for the benefit of his children. Whatever his sacrifice is, however he offers it, whatever it means to consecrate his guests as an activity of God is always for the purpose of saving the people that belong to him. It's never for any other reason. And so it's good to wonder about it, even if we can't know for sure what it always means. Now one of the things that we can tell is by what follows, we can, we can get a little bit of extra information. <laughs> Verses 8 and 9 read, and on the day of the Lord's sacrifice. Now here it says the day of the Lord's sacrifice. It's possible that the previous day of the Lord means the day of the Lord's sacrifice, or maybe not. I, I, I don't know, but on the day of the, of the Lord's sacrifice, which is one of the days of the Lord, God says, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. All right, and so whatever is the sacrifice which the Lord has prepared, it's not removing all punishment because he proceeds to talk about punishment of his people, right? He speaks now in verses 9 of punishment. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, God will punish, and he's going to punish certain men, okay? In particular, and we've seen this in other prophets, he's going to punish public officials, princes, of which he may be one, the prophet himself may be a descendant of Hezekiah, he may be a prince of, of the realm, certainly Josiah and the, and the other members of the royal family will be punished. And others who have turned their backs on the ways of Israel in preference for the ways of foreign people and their false gods, all right, he's going to punish these people. How's he going to punish them? And so that may get a little bit clearer as we read verse 10 and forward, but you have to ask yourself, He's talked about an end of the world when everything is put away. He's talked about an earlier time when he's preparing a sacrifice and sanctifying things in, in, in order to do something to deal with sin, and yet still there's punishment. There's punishment that's coming. In, in, in his future and before the end of the world, there's punishment that's coming. And it's coming against certain people, including the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem even the royal family and public officials and so on. And so if, if you didn't read any farther in this chapter and get more clues, you might ask yourself, what would be the way that God could punish a king? What would be the way that God could punish an official? What would be the way that God could punish a rich landowner by taking away from them the kingdom and the cities and the land? and the other things that they have which make them rich and powerful and comfortable, right? The, the way you punish people who are in charge of something is to take away the thing that they're in charge of. It's the best and perhaps the only way you can punish them, right? And so likely these, these strong leaders are going to be punished by having the kingdom and the city and their property and their gold and their silver and their position and their title and their armies and all the things they really care about will be taken away. That will be punishment for, for these guys, okay, I guess. He speaks here also of punishing people more than just the leaders of the city. He speaks of punishing those who leap over the threshold, it says. And this is another difficult phrase to translate. I think I understand it rightly. Leaping over the threshold would be, for example, 
someone from outside the kingdom who comes in bringing their foreign gods or their, or their foreign ways that corrupts the kingdom. It could also be somebody inside the kingdom who, who's overly attracted to foreign gods and foreign kings and foreign culture and, and goes outside. It's the mixing together of God's people with the people in the lands about, which was exactly the thing that God was always worried about as they occupied the promised land, right? He was always concerned to keep his people separate from the world so that they wouldn't become like the world. But now the problem is that they've become like the world. The world came in and they went out. And they, you, now you can't even tell the difference between the world and God's people. They're so commingled, right? They worship foreign gods and they have foreign ways and they have foreign allies. And so probably leaping the, thre the threshold means people who have intermingled with the, the, the nations, I, I suppose. <coughs> and he also speaks less mysteriously about punish pe people who bring violence and fraud into the household. And so, of course, God is against that. He's, he's against violence, he's against trickery and, and fraud. It could be a reference also, leaping over the threshold, could also be a reference to the Philistines. Is that when they were there, when they captured that ark, their god fell down and his head and arms were broken off on the threshold. So it says that they, they never would step on the threshold. Uh, I don't know. That, that's interesting. I don't know. I hadn't read that any other place, but it could be. So, you know, again, the prophets looked out to the end of time and seen the end of time. He's done much more to say, nevertheless, even though the end of time is coming. He starts by talking to his own people, Israel. He has certain things to say against certain people, particularly the leadership as other prophets have done. And God says he's preparing to do something. He says he's preparing, preparing a sacrifice, which is hard for us to think exactly what it means. But it's easy for us to understand that God is preparing some kind of punishment. And he's speaking of punishment, not destruction, right? This is punishment that's coming presently, not destruction at the end of time. Which is why I put this picture up on, on the PowerPoint, because my understanding about God's character, including what God teaches in the wisdom literature to, to human parents about how to handle human children, spare the rod and spoil the child and so forth. And even in the New Testament, Paul's teaching, the whole Bible teaches us that even human parents who love their children discipline their children. How much more will God discipline his children who he loves? And so the punishment that's coming against them, I understand to be at the root an act of love on the part of God who needs to fix the problem that his children have. I don't think it could just be retribution or revenge or something. God hardly needs to do that. But he will discipline his children. If he really hated them, like Jerry said the other day, if he really hated them, he just wouldn't do anything, right? He wouldn't say anything, he wouldn't do anything, he'd just go away. But instead he's, he's busy doing something here. Um, he's disciplining them. At least that's my way of understanding what God is doing when these difficult things happen. <clears throat> now, even though God may be just a, a loving but stern father disciplining his children, it's not a light punishment that's in view here. When he uses the word punishment, this is a really, really hard, hard punishment that's coming. So if we read verses 10 and 11 quickly of, of chapter 1, it says, On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. All right? And so he's speaking of a cry and a wail and a crash from respectively the fish gate, the second quarter, and the hills. And what that basically is describing is a violent incursion into the city of Jerusalem from the north. The fish gates on the north, that's where they would normally be attacked from, from their usual enemies. After they crash the gate, the next place they'd crash into would be what's called the new quarter or the second quarter. And if they continued on into the city, evidently there's an area in the city called the mortar where people do business trade, probably some hollow area where they sit and they, and they trade. People aren't sure exactly about, about that. But in any case, the, the punishment that's coming is nothing less than the destruction of Jerusalem 
we, as we know from, from, from later history. And of course then, as I said before, if the city is overthrown, if the kingdom is overthrown, if the temple is thrown down, if the businessmen are all robbed of all of their property, then all of these rich princes and officials and traders and everyone are going to be punished in the way that probably they considered to be the most painful by having all of their stuff taken away. God doesn't need to kill them to punish them, but it's a severe punishment that's coming. The city is being taken away from them. And God is, God is, which is why I have a picture up here of, of the, it's supposed to be the fish gate, I can't be sure. But anyway, the city of, of Jerusalem in, in the 6th or 7th century BC and people wailing because their city is being taken away. And of course, all the people will suffer from this punishment. And I think God wants to make it clear that he's not just going to crash the gates of the city and then let come what may. In verse 12, he says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. All right, so he's not just going to knock down the walls of the city and let people be lucky and escape or be punished as, as case may be. God never leaves anything to chance. So individual people are going to be punished in, in, in the way that the Lord deems appropriate. And he's going to, he used this figure of like a nighttime search. This is the picture I had in my mind. He says, I'll search them by lamps, so kind of like a manhunt looking for people. You can't hide. Other prophets have had similar imagery. He's going to find people. And he says, he's going to find everyone who says in their heart that the Lord will not do anything. So remember, these people haven't sought God. They haven't inquired about God. They basically assume God isn't going to do anything bad for them to them because of what they do. And they're also assuming God can't really do anything good either. God can just be ignored. We, we can forget about God because God is like someplace, right? But we're rich and we're ruling this city and everything is, everything is fine. So God expects the people who he's going to finally make his own people and redeem them, not only to fear his punishment, but also to seek his blessings. All right, and this is a sin I have, and I think modern people have as much as the ancient people have, we very easily, without doing anything blatantly disrespectful to God, can live our life as if God won't do anything bad or anything good. We don't, we don't really, a lot of, some people do, but I, maybe I'm worse than most people. I don't, as often as I should, wake up in the morning and I really need God to help me do this, that, and the other thing today. I'm more likely to be afraid God will punish me for my sins because I have a lot of them. But, but I said also, God also wants me to care constantly, thinking that he could do good for me, not just, not just evil, right? And, and God is going to find these people who have forgotten about him because they've turned to other gods or they worship their king or they worship their money or whatever it is that they do. And he's going to get them, each one of them, he says in, 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 verse, in verse 12. Everyone who says in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Right? They just, they're not worried and they don't care what God says. And what's going to happen to them, as I've suggested be before, is elaborated a bit in verses 13 and 14. God says their goods will be plundered and their houses will be laid waste. <clears throat> Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. All right, and so as we've sort of been suspecting the punishment that's coming is they're going to be deprived of their city and all, this, all that goes with it. And it's not going to be a small thing to them. And this day of the Lord that's coming to take their city away, to take their houses away, is not the one at the end of time, but one that's coming much, much sooner. And they're going to cry aloud. Even the mighty men are going to cry aloud because they'll just have everything taken away from them, it seems like, in verses 13 and 14. All right, so... The penalty for ignoring the Lord, if you're lucky, is some, time, some type of suffering. If you're unfortunate, God will just let you ignore him and, and not bring you to suffering, in which case 
when the when the end comes, it's the end for you. I said this a lot of times, I'll say it again, in my life at least, this is one of the things I read in the Bible that I can most easily confirm with my life experience is that if you forget about God, He will remind you. And His reminder will be difficult and painful often, sometimes very difficult and very painful. But you shouldn't despair and think that God is your enemy. On the contrary, you should rejoice that God is still your friend that he's still willing to go out of his way to, to draw your attention to himself. And the, the main way he has to do that is to make you feel like this picture. Right? People are, are slow to appreciate their blessings, but they'll often turn to God if they're suffering, right? And, and that's only for our benefit, as the Apostle Paul teaches also. I'm almost, almost done. All right, and then... <clears throat> The images sort of accelerate here in verses 15 and, and 16. He wants us to be sure that the day of the Lord is really, really, really bad. You remember an earlier prophet who said, you want the day of the Lord? Are you crazy? The day of the Lord will be darkness and not light and so forth and so on. Is there are people running around saying they're waiting for the day of the Lord and they don't even understand that for them the day of the Lord is just going to be awful, right? Because you're going to come in to the presence of the Holy God and you're not ready, you don't want the day of the Lord to, to, to come. And that's why people, even people who are ready, are fearful and trembling. And, and the Bible says their bones turn to mice and their knees wobble because, because even they, even people who are probably ready to, to meet their maker, aren't ready to meet their maker because it's just too terrible to contemplate, right? And so Zephaniah wants to make sure we get it here. The day of the Lord is going to be really, really, really bad for these people who aren't right with God. Verses 15 and 16 say, a day of wrath is that day. And this may be an answer to which day of the Lord is in view presently. Because the word day is used here six times, I think. A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. And a day of triumph and blast and battle cry. Somebody said that the, the mention of the word day six times is the reverse of creation, sort of. I mean, in six days, God created the world and he rested on the seventh day. God is going to break it down for him here backwards, right? This day of the Lord is going to be a big distress for them. Anguish, ruin, devastation, darkness, gloom, clouds, darkness. And then the, in verse 16, we get a kind of military thing, which is why I put up a picture of Nazi stormtroopers here. They say a day of the trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. You know, it's all going to be messy and bad and scary and it's going to be bad. Right? And we don't need to live in Bible times to see images of that, right? Which is why I try to put a modern image every once in a while. We see horror all around us, right, in, in, in the world in, in the 20th and 21st century. Also, lots of strife comes and we have to understand as hard as it is to understand that God is doing something. There is, God is doing something for our benefit if only we could, could see it. All right. <clears throat> All right, so that's verses 15 and 16. And then verse 17 and 18. It says, I will bring distress on mankind. So we've, we've been focused on Jerusalem and Judea and the leaders especially in there. And now he's zooming back out again to the whole world, which is where he started. He was the whole world, Judea and Jerusalem. Now he's back out to the whole world, which is another part of the literary structure here. called chiasm, it says, I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. So, he's been busy in the verses preceding these last two verses with what he calls punishment. 
But the punishment finally proceeds to where the chapter began with final destruction of everything, the whole world. God created at the beginning of time everything perfectly. Men sinned and fell down. God has been busy ever since redeeming a people for himself. The prophet, the spirit and the prophet looks forward and sees that it won't go on forever. There is going to finally be an end, a, a complete end, a telos. History is a straight line going to from beginning to end. It doesn't doesn't cycle where, where God is involved. And so he can see the end, and before the end, he sees that a lot of the sin is going to be dealt with by God through punishment, which which I understand to be salvific. I think God punishes people where there's life, there's hope. Their life is difficult, but so long as God is talking and so long as God is moving, they have a, a, a chance, right? But they better hurry because in another sense, the day of the Lord is near. The universe will finally be finished and by the way, we'll all finally die and go to the grave. Time is always limited in, in order to respond to the message that God, that, that God has for us, including the punishment that he gives us sometimes to wake us up. And this is the same message in, in Habakkuk we saw before, right? The righteous shall live by faith. Not the puffed up one whose spirit's not right within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. In the Old Testament, God is looking for people who can just put their faith in God despite everything. That's how they're going to live. But here, if men persist too long in resisting God, comes a kind of blindness, he says, which may make it impossible for them to return, and then they'll finally be consumed by the wrath of God. And this is, I keep saying, but, but with increasing conviction, this is the gospel as seen through the poetic spirit of the Old Testament. It's the same gospel in that sense that we have in the light of Christ. It's much clearer for us because we can see it in the light of Christ. But for the prophet Habakkuk and Zephaniah and all of the other prophets, it's basically the same exercise, right? Sin is everywhere. God is calling people to just turn back to him. The only way you can flee from God is to flee to God. It may seem crazy too because it seems like he's punishing us and he's scary and our bones turn to mush and our legs are wobbly and all of that. But the, but the righteous shall live by faith. It means you actually have to believe God exists. You actually have to believe he wants to save you and then you have to trust in that and just go there and see what happens, right? And then you'll be saved. And that's what Jesus makes plain, plainer also. And if Jesus is indeed the sacrifice that God is preparing here, as seen by the, by the prophet Zephaniah, that would be a really nice Old Testament citation. I don't know if people have read that as Christological or not. Okay, so that's the first chapter of... One of the scarier prophets in the, in the Old Testament. Anybody have any question or comment? One of the things that I've learned, you know, pre preparing to teach this class, um, but I'd never quite appreciated it before, is that prophecy is poetry by and large. And, and some of it's even musical. We studied Habakkuk and they had instructions for musical instruments at the end, like the Psalms and other things. And the, the Jews who, who had this prophecy would listen to it read or sung Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath throughout the cycle of worship over the years. And if you think of modern song lyrics or poetry, you know, you listen to, even in English, if I listen to a really good poem like 
T.S. Eliot or something like that, and I'd study in college, and I think, it's English, but it's really hard to understand because there's a lot going on in, in the poem. So I read it the first time, and a, a few years later I may read it again, or I may find a good teacher who can say, well, think about it this way, and I read it again, and I read it again. I talk to somebody else who reads the poem. Finally, before I die, maybe, I may kind of understand that poet a little bit, right? And I think that Old Testament prophets are a lot like that. This is, a lot of this is very high poetry written in Hebrew and then translated into English. And it's meant, even if we could read it in Hebrew, we'd have to listen to it again and again and again and hear the opinions of our teachers and our brothers and sisters. And we'd start to, to learn something about God that's not easy to say in more clear language, right? God is hard to describe because you can't compare him to anything. You can't say God is like this because God isn't like anything, right? And so the only way you can describe God is sort of in, indirectly and, and even then imperfectly. And so the prophets are trying to help us catch something which is almost impossible to catch. And so it's not helping you or me or anybody to come to a class like this and say, well, this means this and this means this and that means that because nobody knows that so clearly. People begin to have opinions about the gist of it, it makes you feel a certain way. Like you listen to a song and you feel a certain way, but it, it's sort of an artistic aspect to it, you know, that to also. So um, don't feel bad or cheated if, if you don't have an absolutely clear understanding of biblical prophecy, because I don't think you're supposed to have that kind of an understanding of biblical prophecy. And the people who do are almost surely wrong. People who really think that they understand all of this, no, no, this means this, and that means that, and that means that, that means that, you know. There have been people like that down through the years, and they've always been wrong. <laughs> so, so it's not like that. It's, it's talking, of, it's saying, it, what, you know, introducing you to God. <laughs> um, it's very hard to understand. Sorry, one other thing that I, that I feel like saying is that one of my weaknesses, I like to think a lot, so I like I have this theology and I can say, well, this is my theology. And this is how the Bible fits into my theology. And pretty soon my theology has turned the Bible into my theology. But God isn't like that. God is completely free. He's wild and he's free and he can do what he wants to do. And nobody can really understand him because he's God, right? And so the prophets understood that. It doesn't all have to make perfect sense and fall into some neat theology because that's not who God is, right? God isn't like that at all. We have to really be afraid of Him sometimes and we have to really beg Him for help sometimes and we have to really not understand Him sometimes and, and stuff. And when we get too comfortable with our understanding, that's when we're probably starting to misunderstand, you know, some too, I think. It occurs to me. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for um, being a God who, despite being all-powerful, takes an almost unmeasured amount of time to talk to people like us who can barely understand anything about your glory. We uh, don't apologize for that, Lord, because you made us and you know our limitations. We do, however, um, confess our sin, which is not acceptable, and we ask your forgiveness, Lord, because with the freedom that you've given us, so often we choose to do things that we know, we absolutely do know are wrong. And this is sin and we're so sorry for that. We know that being the holy God that you are, this exposes us to the ultimate risk of just being destroyed by your goodness. Um, and we thank you, Lord, that you have found a way for us to be saved, which was seemingly impossible. Um, the Old Testament guys like we're reading about, they could sort of smell it and sense it and they trusted you to, to bring them through. But we've seen your truth and your beauty in the light of Christ and we know that salvation is definitely possible and that it doesn't depend on our goodness, but it does depend on our faith. We thank you for giving us faith and we pray that you'll please build our faith up and our understanding as much as is good for us so that we can um, enjoy you uh, eternally in this world and in the next. And we pray that all of the people who haven't heard the good news about Christ and the salvation that's available through him can hear it and that maybe sometimes you could use us as an instrument of sharing the news with them. 
We ask all of these things in Jesus' name, and we ask also, Lord, that you'd help everybody get home safely tonight. Amen.